Morgan, thank you uh, once again uh, for taking the time. And it would be great to get a bit of sense of your background and how you got into doing what you do. Yeah, so I, I've always been interested in finance. I think just the basic idea, literally, of, uh, of money working for you, that it can, it can make money for you without you having to work, with you just sitting on the couch, you're making money. That fascinated me from an early age. So all throughout college, uh, I was drawn to, towards investment banking. That's really what I wanted to do. I think I was young and inexperienced, and the money of investment banking is, is a big allure when you're young. You say, look how much money I can make when I'm young, right out of college. I can make six figures in the United States. It's great. You yeah. make millions of dollars later in your career. That was really appealing to me. And I, I got uh, an investment banking internship in yeah. junior year of college. And I realized right away, literally from the first day, that it wasn't for me. Okay. And that was, that was really depressing for me because <laughs> this is all I ever wanted to do. I was dreaming of being an investment banker. And it, it's a really tough culture yeah. in investment banking. But if you're not familiar with it, it's just a very, very tough. You work 100-hour weeks. You never see the daylight. Your boss is yelling at you all day. It's a really difficult culture to excel in. It just didn't fit my personality. Okay, so I need to do something else in finance now. What am I going to do? I got a job in private equity, which was great. That's a little less, uh, less pressure than investment banking. You can still make a good living. But this was 2007. The credit markets froze up. The, the world came to an end effectively in the financial world. Okay, yeah. so now I need to do something else. What am I going to do? Well, I still love finance. I never lost my love for finance, even after I kept getting discouraged in all these jobs. So I found a job as uh, an investment writer with The Motley Fool. And I never in a million years thought I would be an investment writer. But I fell in love with it right away. It's just I think it's a great way to express your thoughts. And I really realized that I think what I like about investing is just thinking about ways – just thinking about – really world problems, problems that people have in their personal life, or global economies, I'm just trying to think about them in new ways. And I really fell in love with just writing about it, trying to change how people think about basic financial topics rather than uh, the investment banker that's trying to go out there and really uh, take over the world, I guess, so to speak. I'm just really trying to get people to think differently about investing in personal finance topics. So that's how I got to from, uh, from dreaming about investing as a kid to where I am today. Great. So, and, 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 and you, you know, in a way, I look at what you do as 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 almost providing sort of some financial literacy, right? Uh, what have what has what has the journey been like? So, you know, is it skepticism that you normally draw? Like, you know, what is? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure you're having to deal with lots of people who haven't done anything about their money for 40 years have just put it in a bank. Uh, you know, right. I, 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 do you have these conversations, or is it much more an offline relationship? So you don't you don't know. Um, well, I think. What's, what's really interesting about finance, I think this is true for a lot of fields too, whether you're in physics or math or chemistry or history or whatever it is, the more you learn, yeah. the more you realize how little you know. Yeah. And I, that's really been true for me with finance, that uh, in the years that I've been studying it, the more I know, the more I research, the more I talk to other smart investors, the more I realize how little I know about it. Or really what it is, is the more I realize how complex investing is. Mm. And it's, it's, it's almost always more complex, more complicated than we think it is. I think we have a t natural tendency to want to think that it's very clean and simple and elegant and I can just do A plus B equals C and that's how I do it and it's really simple. But investing is very complicated. It's an interaction of psychology and math and history and politics and it's all just mushed together and it's really complicated. It's just always more complicated than we think it is. So my, my, my journey, I think, has been one towards growing gradually more humble over the years. And I would say each year that goes by, I realize that I know less and less. It's, it's been humbling, and I'll, I'll probably continue going on. It'll get to the point where I'm 90 years old, and I just throw up my hands and say, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, is the, what is the typical uh, sort of advice you give to, to folks who, who, are, who are just getting started or slash haven't done anything? What is, what's the, how, do you start, how do you get them started? You know, if you're really just started in investing, what's really important is not necessarily when you're young, the investment decisions that you make. It's, it's, save, it's saving as much money as possible. Rather than getting caught up in the details about the, the different kinds of investments you're making, I, I think if a young person just really focuses on getting their work skills, investing in themselves, I guess I should say, through education and work experience, and then trying to save as much money as possible, you know, that for me is really the base of the pyramid, so to speak. I think if you're the kind of investor that really has no interest in business or finance or the stock market investing, just investing in a low-cost index fund, dollar-cost averaging, so you're putting in the same amount of money every month over time, 
that's really a smart approach for I, for, I think most investors that don't want to spend a lot of time mm-hmm. doing this are really not interested in it. But you know, I, I really think that people that are interested in business and interested in commerce and economics, not necessarily interested in trading or the stock market, but really are passionate about business. Those are the people that I think, you know, yeah, really can do well for themselves over the long run, over the course of 20 or 30 or 40 years, investing in really good, high-quality companies that they feel confident about, a good, diverse mix, and really, specific, really importantly, uh, companies that they plan on holding for a long period of time. The biggest problem investors find themselves in mm-hmm. is they just get impatient. And they want it. They want it. You know, the worst is day trading stocks. But even if you're holding stocks for weeks or months, you're really letting random chance dictate uh, the course of events at that point. Where people that hold stocks for 10, 20, 30, 50 years, those are the people that end up succeeding as investor. So, so to sum up, that was a long answer to say. You know, if you're not interested in it, I think index funds are great. If you are interested in, it, I think holding a basket of high quality companies for decades if you can is really the, the key to successful and, and and what is your approach been so far which 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 one do you follow or what's the typical overall formula yeah so i i i basically go right down the middle and how i do it with my investing is i always dollar cost average every month into index funds and index funds attracts the s&p 500 or you know the the vanguard total stock market index i do that every month come rain or shine the same amount of money so that's that's part of more that's part of my portfolio. Mm-hmm. But I also, you know, once or twice a year, I come across an individual investing idea that is very compelling to me. That doesn't mm-hmm. happen very often. You know, really, it really is once or twice a year. And when it when it I come across something that I uh, that really compels me, that I really think that there's an opportunity for value for someone who wants to hold stocks for many many years or decades, then I will invest in that company. So I I, I don't subscribe to the idea that one should only index. Or only pick stocks. I, I I don't think it's contradictory to do a little of both. So that's mm-hmm. what I've done with my money. Okay. So uh, you don't mention real estate. So tell me a little bit about uh, about your views on houses, because the conventional wisdom uh, from parents or from anybody is typically go buy a house and and then you're kind of good for a while. How do you think yeah. about that? Well, I have some I have some different views on real estate than most people. I've never owned a home. I don't own a home right now, and I, I never have. I, I I will someday, but I think most people really get caught up in the idea that a house will make a fantastic investment for them. And I just really don't think there's much historical evidence for that. I think a home makes a good place to live in, and that provides value for you, of course. You know, you can get a great place to live in, spend the holidays with your family, have a barbecue with your friends. That's great. The idea of the home as an investment, there's really not much evidence backing that up. Robert Schiller of Yale has done some great research on the long-term history of home prices in the United States, and it really shows... Uh, fairly clearly that adjusted for inflation over long periods of time, uh, home prices nationwide, nationwide really don't go anywhere. They really, they're pretty much flat after inflation over time. It was really just the early 2000s that America got this idea that a home is a great investment, that you can, just, you can buy it and hold it and you'll make a fortune off your home. Hmm. I think the, one of the big uh, pieces that people miss when considering a home and investment is one, most people when they buy a home, they take out a substantial mortgage. And then they think, well, great, now I'm not renting it. I'm not renting, I'm not renting a house anymore. Now I own it. Well, no, if you take out a mortgage, the bank owns your home, and you are renting the house from the bank effectively. You're renting money from the bank yeah. to buy the house. Yeah. And, then, and then when people well, say, well, they pay off their house over time, they build up equity, well, there's an option cost to that equity and that the money that you, you use to buy a home could have been money that you could invest in the stock market over time. And over long periods of time, we know historically that the stock market has generated real uh, returns after inflation in far superior to that of real estate. So like I said, I, I, I will buy a house someday when I'm, when I'm settled down. My, my wife is in school right now, so we're always moving around. So it, it doesn't work for us right now. I'll buy a home someday when I find a house that I like that will fit my style of living. But I'll never think of it as an investment. I'll just think of it as a place to live. Right. And, 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 and I guess ideally you'd think of it as a place where you're going to be there at least for 10, 15 years, right? To make yeah, it, Exactly. You know, here, here in the United States, most people have a 30-year mortgage. Yeah. But they live in the house, but they live in the house for an average of eight years. Hmm. Uh, and that really gets people into problems too when you factor in realtor fees. You know, you buy or sell a house, you're going to pay a, a big chunk to your to real estate agent. Yeah. And it's, it's really just like investing. It's really the, 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 the single most important variable uh, for investing in the stock market is really how long are you invested for. And I really think it's the same for owning a home as well. So yeah, w- w- once I'm settled in a place that I can know I can, I'll reasonably be here for 10 or 15 years or more, then I'll, then I'll buy a house. But 
Cool. So the next one is, you, so you said, interestingly, uh, investing or at least finance is, is this whole interplay between psychology, history, uh, you know, uh, money, etc., etc. Uh, how do yep. you see the role of psychology in this? Because the big question is a lot of a lot of books are written saying, you know, you can, you know, build up your portfolio of index funds, etc., etc. But is it really that simple? Is uh, can everybody do it? Uh, you know, how do you control your mind, right? Because it's one thing just to use the famous Warren Buffett quote of, you know, I will invest when everybody is when I when I see fear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, right. it's so hard to do. Right. No, it's absolutely true. I, I think the single, if you look at successful investors over time, the investors who are the most successful are not the people with the best math skills or the most complicated uh, formula or model or the best Excel skills, you know, the, the best engineers. It's almost invariably the best investors are the people that have control over their emotions. Mm -hmm. We see that time and time again. It's just the people who don't panic. There's a very good book called Deep Survival. Okay. And, and Deep Survival chronicles... Uh, all these stories about people that have survived extreme events, plane crashes and being stuck in blizzards and having their boat stranded in the middle of the ocean. Why do some people survive and other people perish? Well, the common denominator in survivors in these, in these extreme situations is that, the, is that the survivors did not panic when everyone else did. And I think that's very applicable to investing as well. That the successful investors that you see over time are just people that found a situation where the market was crashing and everyone, around, everyone else around them was panicking. And they manage to not panic themselves. Those are the people that do great over time. One of my favorite quotes is from Napoleon who said his, his definition of a military genius was the man who can do the average thing when everyone else around him is losing their mind. That's true for investing too. You don't need to be a genius. You just need to do the average thing when everyone else is going crazy. If you were just an average investor in 2008 and you just dollar cost averaged, you didn't do anything fancy. You just kept putting money into the stock market month after month after month and you just didn't panic, you would have done fantastic over the past five years. It's the people that really lost their minds uh, that have a hard time at investing. So how do you control that? That's, that's the big question. You know, I think you really have to know yourself and know your own emotions. And if you know that you are the kind of person that is going to get very emotional when the market messes, you, you, have, a, you have a low risk tolerance, then I think it's important to structure your portfolio correctly and that maybe you have a higher portion of your portfolio in bonds or cash or something that won't be as volatile so that you're not going to lose your head when the stock market crashes and you see half of your net worth disappear, which you will, that will happen if you have all of your money in stocks. And if you have a strong enough stomach and you can put up with that, great. Then those are the people that make good investors. But it's really important to know yourself and know your risk tolerance uh, and be honest with yourself about how tolerant you are of risk and structure your portfolio uh, accordingly. I, I think the other big thing with behavioral finance is that mo you know, most people are investing for years or decades. Mm -hmm. But in today's 24-hour news cycle, and we have so much information online, Yahoo Finance, CNBC, and whatnot, it's tempting to look at your portfolio all day long, like mm -hmm. minute by minute by minute. And I think that's very dangerous for a lot of people. I think most people should be looking at their portfolio really once a quarter, you know, four times a year. Uh, and I think when people start looking at it more, it just, it, it creates this idea that the market is a short-term, you know, circus. You fall on, and that just does things with your head. It makes you more attuned to, uh, it, 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 it changes how you think about risk, I think. So I think the less attention you pay to the stock market, the better. Those are the kind of people that will do well in the long run. And, 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 and so the other thing that can help, right, is, is this whole history component. So, so it's, it's sort of getting to know, because, you know, every time I think you get to a bust, it feels like the end of the world and the end of the stock market as we know it. And yet it isn't. Right. And, and, and you realize it's fairly normal. So, so, right. so, so, so can you talk me through a little bit about your views on uh, after having read uh, sort of financial history and, and the nature of booms and busts? Yeah, so I, I think it's really important for every investor to know long-term financial history. And the most important thing to know when you look at long-term financial, uh, financial history is that volatility in the stock market is perfectly normal. Yeah. It's the equivalent of having summers every year. Like We know it's going to get hot every year in the summer, yeah. but that doesn't freak us out. We, we don't think the world is going to melt. We just know it's summer, it's okay, it'll be hot for a little while, and then it'll cool off again when, when fall hits. That's just how it works. People understand that about the weather because they know because it happens every year. But in the stock market, it's different. We know historically 
that the stock market is going to fall. You know, we, we don't know when. That's the difference between stocks and, and seasons, I guess. We don't know when it's going to happen, but yeah. we know that the market is going to crash. If you look historically, the stock market falls 10% basically once every year. Yeah. That's basically, you, know, you, you, you go back more than 100 years of data almost every year. You get a 30% crash basically once a decade, and you get a 50% crash two or three times per century. You know, the odds are very high that that'll, that'll be the case going forward. You know, mm. you, if you're a long-term investor, you can expect every year you're going to lose 10% of your money. Every decade, you're going to lose 30% of your money. And maybe once or twice in your life, you're going to lose half your money. You can expect mm. that as an investor. It's perfectly normal. Over the long course of that period, despite that volatility, the odds are high that you will do well as an investor over the long run. But yeah, so I think just getting acquainted with how normal volatility is is really important because like you said, every time we get one of these market pullbacks, people think, this is it. It's the end of the world and you know, yeah. I, I need to cash out and get out, even though we know that's not the case. So even some of the worst events that we've ever been through, the Great Depression, world wars throughout Europe that devastated the entire economies, you know, it, you know there's, there's not much, much precedence for even after inflation, when you include dividends, 10, 15 years is about what is, it's taken for the market to recover from really bad, awful events. You know, even during the Great Depression in the United States, stocks fell 90% yeah. from 1929 to 1933. Yeah. If you're just for inflation and dividends, you've got to include dividends. That's a really important part of that calculation. Yeah. Stocks yeah. are back to a new high by 1937. Thank so you. even that, the Great Depression, the worst event we've ever experienced, took six, seven, eight years but to, 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 to regain your losses. And 2008, you know, we had a massive market meltdown. Stocks fell 50%. Stocks are back at a new all-time high by 2012. So... Hmm. You know, these things are normal, and they're not. It's not fun when it happens, but if you understand how normal they are, it makes investing a lot easier. Hmm. Great. And uh, I, I guess you know, a final few before uh, before we get into sort of a bunch of just uh, I say just for fun sort of questions. Uh, wh- yeah. Who've been uh, your uh, your investment gurus uh, per se, right? And where have you drawn uh, sort of you know your learning and 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 inspiration from? I guess. Some of my the people who have been most influential to my thinking, I don't think have been investors per se. I think I think Nassim Taleb, uh, author of The Black Swan, has been very influential in how I think about risk. Uh, he is an investor, but when he writes, it's more just about risk and history and philosophy in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he has a very abrasive personality, so it's hard <laughs> it, it's it's hard to like him as an, as as a human, as a person, I guess, <laughs> it's awful as that says. But I think he is, he is a brilliant writer and he is a brilliant thinker about risk. Mm. He's changed a lot. He's, he's really been influential on me. There's a journalist from Canada named Dan Gardner who wrote a book called The Science of Fear. Mm-hmm. That book, I think, changed the way I think about the media and fear more than anything else. He really just details about how risk in general is blown out of proportion by headline writers and the mm. 24-hour news cycle and how human emotions in general just make us think and interpret risk in really irrational ways. That, that really changed my thinking. I, I think a lot of historians have changed how I think about investing and that historians by nature take a very long-term view of everything. You know, historians measure time in decades or centuries, mm-hmm. whereas most in, uh, so many investors measure time in seconds or minutes or weeks. Mm. So I think being a reader of history has really changed how I think about investing as well. Uh, and I, I also try to spend a lot of time focusing on, on bad investors. So rather than having an investment guru that I follow, I, I, I spend a lot of time paying attention to the investors that have failed. I think there's a lot more that you can learn from failed investors than successful investors. So I, I try to spend a, t- a lot of time looking at who has done and, and, and the you worst. Say that, and you say that because, because you, you figure out what they didn't do. What they didn't do, and I think you know, the biggest risk that an individual investor will face in life is not that they will fail to become Warren Buffett. The biggest risk that they face is that they will become the next Lehman Brothers. You know, they'll go bankrupt. That's so. When that's the biggest risk, you have more to learn from the failures rather than successes. And that's not to say that you, there's nothing to learn from successful investors. I think I think it's great to study successful investors, but it, I think it's of the utmost importance to study people that have done it wrong. And not just from investing, but finance in general. People that have, have worked in a stressful job all their lives and die unhappy. Like you can learn a lot from those people about what is important in life and what's important with money. People that bury themselves in debt, in student debt, and have to stay in a job that they hate for decades just to be able to afford 
their student debt payments. You know, young, a young person can learn a lot from that, uh, from, from those stories. Uh, and they can learn valuable life lessons that will affect them more than studying people like Warren Buffett uh, and, and, and trying to figure out how to become the world's richest billionaire. I think studying the failures is, is a lot more relevant to the average person. And, and how does today's exorbitant uh, education costs sort of fit in with your with your whole framework? I mean, it's, it's yeah. getting tougher and tougher and tougher to, to, to really afford a, a, an education these days. Yeah, it's, it's, it's growing more expensive as the year goes by. I think I think for the average middle class or or, 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 or or even someone with a below average income, I think there are ways to go to college that are maybe untraditional. I think so many people look at college as I need to go to the best school, the private school that's fifty thousand dollars a year, that's where I'll get my education and they say it's worth it even if I have to take out loans and I have to take out a quarter million dollars of debt to go to Harvard or Stanford, that's worth it. I, I think that's very often not the case. And I think if someone is really in a mediocre financial position where they don't have money from their parents or an uncle or a grandparent or a scholarship to get them through college, I think one of the best ways to do it is to start out at a local junior college, a local community college. You can go there for two years and get all your general education credits out of the way for dirt cheap. It costs next to nothing to go to some of these schools. And then after that, transfer to a state university where you can finish up your degree uh, at a state university for usually much lower cost than you can do at a private university. I think if people do that, so you have two years of community college, two years of state university. Most people can do that, and it varies by state, but most people can do that for a pretty reasonable amount of money. Maybe you still have to borrow a little bit, and that's unfortunate, but I see so many people who are of, of moderate income or below average income and they go to a private school and take out a quarter million dollars worth of debt, and they end up just burying them themselves for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So I think there are many different ways that people can go to college, and I think that's often overlooked. But there are different colleges out there that serve different purposes at different prices. Perfect. So, uh, you know, what are some what are some books, TV shows, movies that 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 you really like? Yeah, uh, one of, some of my favorite books. There was a there was a, a historian uh, in the mid 20th century named Frederick Lewis Allen. He wrote three books. One of my favorite is called The Big Change. And The Big Change looks at how the United States changed culturally, economically, politically from 1900 to 1950. And the change that took place in the United States from 1900 to 1950, I think, was so much bigger than the change that took place from 1950 to 2000. I mean, really, if you think in 1900, we had horse and buggy. By 1950, we had jets. From and then... So, so, so that was what we had the first half of the 20th century. In the second half of the century, of the 20th century, we went from jet to faster jet. So horse and buggy to jet, and then jet to faster jet. Like, there was so much change that took place in, in, the, in, the early, uh, in, in the early 20th century. And Frederick Lewis Allen just does a fantastic job explaining how the average American's uh, family life, their work life, uh, change during that time, how their incomes change. It's really just eye-opening and fascinating. He also wrote two more books. One was called Since Yesterday, and one was called Only Yesterday. Uh, they describe life in America in the 1920s and the 1930s, and they're just very well done. I learned so much from Frederick Lewis Allen. Uh, some other books that I tried, I, I, I mentioned Dan, uh, Dan Gardner's The Science of Fear. That was just a very influential book that I, that I read. really changed how I think a lot. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some more recent books. I, I think uh, Daniel Yergin, he's written, he's written two books on energy that were really fascinating. One was called The Quest and the other was called The Prize. He won the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Prize. And it's just, they're just very well done about the history of oil in the United States. It's really just fascinating. Uh, Where well, you put me on the spot, I gotta th let me think of one other book that I, that I really like. Well, and that's, I, I mentioned uh, Nassim Taleb. You know, he's obviously famous for his book, The Black Swan, and now Anti-Fragile. He wrote another book that it most, I, I didn't get almost any attention at all. It was called The Bed of Procrustes. And it was just a, it's just a book of one-liner little quick uh, pithy phrases that Taleb came up with. So it's like hundreds of just little individual sentences about life. Uh, just, uh, they're, they're basically inspirational quotes that Taleb came up with. I think it's a very good book as well. 
So if, if you gave me an hour, I could keep naming off books, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep it there. There's five for you. <laughs> Excellent. And so, you know, what are some, uh, what are some little, uh, of course, you know, you're investing for the long term, so, but this is a very short term question. What are some productivity hacks uh, that you employ to, 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 you know, get stuff done and, 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 and do more? Well, I think as most writers are, I am a big, uh, I, I'm a big procrastinator. Um, you know, if, if, if you give me two weeks to do something, I'm going to, I'm going to do it the night before it's due. Uh, so I, I, I do most of my work from home. I, I don't work very frequently in an office. And when I work from home, it's really important that I still keep a normal schedule as if I worked in an office. Cause when you work at home, it's so tempting to just sit on the couch uh, and, and, and watch Breaking Bad and eat donuts and drink coffee. And it's very easy to not work. So I try to keep a normal schedule as if I was going into the office. I wake up in a shower and I put on normal clothes. That's one of my productivity hacks for working at home. What else do I do, do differently? I go for a lot of walks. I think there are several studies that show, and for me it's really true, that when you go for a walk and you're actively moving or going for a drive but walking is cheaper, you think differently. Yeah. Just the act of the scenery changing around you it just makes you think differently. So I, 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 I found I'm, I'm much more creative and uh, thoughtful when I'm walking. So I spend a lot of time going for walks during the day. That really helps me think. Rather, if you're just sitting stationary, your mind just kind of becomes stationary as well. Cool. So that's another. Yep. And, and so, so the final question would be, what is, what is an idea that inspires you that you would like to share? Well, I, I think the, the idea that inspires me for investing in most of life is really simple and it's not very insightful, but I think it's the most powerful is just the power of time. I, you know, the, the, the single most important variable for how you'll do as an investor is how long can you stay invested for. Hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's really imperative for young people in their teens or their 20s to really understand how valuable an asset it is that you have, that you have so much time in front of you. If you're 20 years old, or 25 years old, you have an asset that Warren Buffett cannot dream about. You have the power of time in front of you, and the power that time will do to your investments in compounding, or for your career and the fact that you can make mistakes and try it over again, that time is so incredibly valuable to people. And I'm just always astounded when I think about compound interest and the power that it has for investing, just how massively powerful time is. So that's, that, that, that's my secret to investing. That, I think, is the most powerful concept in investing. And I think it's, very importantly, the single most overlooked aspect of investing as well. Perfect. Morgan, thank you so much. 